morning, everyone. It was a weird experience. We actually got here relatively on time. So we were like, wow, this is what it's like when it seems like nobody's going to come. But it's nice to see everybody here. Uh, usually we show up and the place is already packed. So it's good. Um, so I'll just start with a word of prayer and then uh, we'll get to it, Lord. We thank you, Lord, that we can always come and we can gather as brothers and sisters, as your children, Lord, to, to worship you, to open up our hearts and our souls, and to just acknowledge you as the creator of the universe and the, uh, uh, the author of our salvation, Lord. We thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to, uh, to read and to experience it, to understand it. And I just pray, Lord, now that you would speak to us through your Holy Spirit and that you would guide us in truth and in understanding, Lord. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, it was mentioned a few times already today, um, but we live in very uncertain times. Um, in a world such as ours, we have the opportunity to hear some calamity or anything from all across the world. And so we seem to be given, almost on a daily basis, a new reason to fear or to wonder uh, what tomorrow will bring. And just over a week ago, much of the world stopped and looked in horror at what was happening in Paris, France. Um, nearly 130 people were killed in a, in a series of terrorist attacks across the city, and people you know, can't help but wonder at what is going on and to feel and to, and to share in that grief, even though it's half a world away. Um, the sad thing, though, perhaps, is that if that wasn't enough, on that very same day, a Palestinian gunman shot and killed a rabbi and a son near uh, Hebron in Israel. On that same day, there was multiple bombings in Baghdad, Iraq, that killed nearly 30 people. On that same day, a landslide in China, province, uh, Xinjiang province, killed nearly five people and injured dozens more. And on that same day, in an apartment in Wallenfels, Germany, authorities found the bodies of eight dead babies. Any one of these events would be reason enough to wonder about what tomorrow holds. To have them all happen on the same day could be overwhelming. To know that a day like this, while not typical, is unfortunately no longer uncommon in our modern world. It's understandable that people worry that they are anxious concerning what happens, what's happening in the world and what's going to happen tomorrow, what's in store for them. Recently at school, we got together as a group of teachers and we sat down to discuss the results of a student survey that was conducted at the school. And one of the things that we really tried to focus on was this idea, or the, not the idea, but the reality, the fact that when we talk to students, they all express a high level of anxiety. Anxiety about how their year is going, anxiety about things that are happening in their homes, anxiety about what's happening in the community, anxiety about their future, where they'll get into university will even graduate high school will they make it through high school um, in preparing for this message I wanted to you know just make sure that I knew exactly what I, the terms meant and so I looked up the definitions for anxious and I looked up the definition for anxiety and when I looked them up the top link in Google was 12 signs that you may have an anxiety disorder obviously this is a very common issue I then chose to look up anxiety medication, which compares, get, yielded the result, compare 57 different anxiety medications. Worry, anxiousness, anxiety is an all too common experience for people today. And it's not enough that there are tragedies happening around the world that we have made privy to as a result of worldwide communications, a 24-hour news cycle, but we hear even in local news or what have you uh, of new reasons to fear and to wonder and they feed our sense of anxiousness on an almost daily basis in the news about nearly anything and everything and how it's a new way to harm us or it's a new hazard in our life or how this thing that you've taken for granted all your life could now all of a sudden kill you. If one watches the news one could come to the conclusion that uh, fear sells. Add this to the near ubiquitous stories of money and about having enough money saved up for a rainy day. Do you have enough money saved up for retirement? Are you going to be able to last, you know, like people are living longer? And all these things, and they just cause us to worry and to, and to wonder and to, 
really start to think about what it is that we have prepared for us. Worse, though, is the reality for those people who are simply living paycheck to paycheck, wondering if the money that I have in my bank account will make it to the next paycheck, let alone retirement. And worse still are those that are going to go to bed tonight, wondering where they might get their next meal. I think that a natural reaction to all of this is that it's easy to worry and it's easy for anxiety to take over control of our lives. It wasn't meant to be this way. So today I'd like to talk from Matthew chapter 6. Uh, I'm going to start in verse 19. So Matthew chapter 6, Jesus is uh, giving his Sermon on the Mount. And what looks perhaps at first blush to be a, a couple of disconnected thoughts is actually speaking to the same issue. So Matthew chapter 6, starting in verse 19, we'll read to the end of the chapter, verse 34. So he says, Do not lay up for yourself treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourself treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. <coughs> Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, neither toil or spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you? O oh, you of little faith! Therefore do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Jesus tells us, do not be anxious about your life, and do not be anxious about tomorrow. And I think if we're honest with ourselves, we might think that if it were only that easy to simply stop worrying about the thousand different things that go buzzing around in our heads every day, demanding our attention and leaving us to wonder of how or if any of them will ever be worked out. But if we notice the language that Jesus uses here, he is not offering this as a suggestion, but rather he's offering it as a command. As a father, if I tell my son, do not play on the road or do not touch the stove, I am not offering a simple suggestion to him. I'm not offering it in a way that he can choose to ignore. It's clearly not my intent. He may choose to ignore me, to ignore my command, but if he does, he may suffer as a result. I tell him to do these things not to burden him or to keep, him, keep something from him, but rather to help him and to see him protected. I believe that Jesus' intentions are the same. That in commanding us not to be anxious, Jesus is seeking to help us and to see us protected. I don't think that it's easy, but I think that it's necessary to live the life that God would have us live. Jesus begins his teaching on this by talking about our heart. He says that rather than storing up for ourselves treasures here on earth, we should be storing up for ourselves treasures in heaven. <coughs> Why? He says, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So the state of our heart is very important. 
what our heart desires, what it cherishes, what has captured our heart will influence will influence the lives that we lead. Jesus says in, in Luke chapter 6, the good person out of the good treasure of his heart produces good. And the evil person out of the evil treasure, out of his evil treasure produces evil. For out of the abundance of the heart his mouth speaks. Therefore, the orientation of our heart matters. And we have to ask, is our heart oriented towards the riches of this world, or is it oriented towards the kingdom that is to come? The orientation of our heart shows us who our master is. If our hearts are oriented towards the wealth of this world, then our lives will be lived in such a way as to accumulate wealth. Our lives will be lived in service to this school, and as such, money is our master. Money has become our God. If, on the other hand, our hearts are oriented towards the riches of heaven, then our lives will seek this school, and as such, God is our master. Jesus tell us, tells us that we cannot live for both. We can't live a life divided. We can't live serving both money and God. Paul wrote to Timothy and said, For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evils. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. Jesus says in Matthew 19, Truly I say to you, only with difficulty will a rich person enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. When the disciples heard this, they were greatly astonished, saying, Who then can be saved? Notice the disciples' reaction. They were greatly astonished by the idea that a rich person might have difficulty entering God's kingdom. Why would this be? Perhaps they were influenced by Greek and Roman thinkers who believed that their, the here and now was a reflection of what was to come. That if you were successful in this life, you would be rewarded in the next. And if you suffered in this life, you could hope for nothing more than suffering in the next. But isn't this how many people think today? That their wealth, their comfort, their prosperity in this life is a sign of God's favor and a sign that they are destined for heaven. Don't many today believe that suffering in this life is a sign that they have incurred God's disfavor, and as such they are in jeopardy of not only being separated from God's grace in this life, but in the next as well? Isn't such a belief more in line with the hearts and minds of those that have created an idol of money rather than the gospel of Christ? How then can we ensure that our hearts are oriented properly? In verse 22, Jesus says, The eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness? What we set our eyes on, what we focus on, will guide our minds and our hearts. Chris Lungard, in his book, The Enemy Within, says it this way, that our minds are the watchmen for the soul commanded to judge and determine whether something is good and pleasing to God, so that the affections can long for it and the will can choose it. When asked what was the greatest commandment, Jesus answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. If we are focusing upon Christ, our body will be full of light, for Christ is light. If we are focusing on the world, then we are taking our eyes off of Christ, and therefore we are taking our eyes away from the light, and as such our, might, our minds and our hearts will be filled with darkness. <coughs> How does this happen? It happens when we allow the cares and concerns of this world to dominate our focus to the point that our hearts care more about these worldly concerns than it does the will of God. As we do this, the number of things to worry about begin to build, and as they build, we become less and less in control, which leads, of course, to ever-increasing levels of anxiety. We become anxious because we have come to care more about the here and now rather than God's will and growing in Christ. We become anxious because we allow our minds to dwell on the difficulties and troubles of this world to the point that we lose sight of the fact that it is God that is in control and that we are valuable in God's eyes. 
So how do we fix this? How do we keep from becoming anxious? How do we keep anxiety from coming to dominate our lives? We follow the advice of Jesus and do as he commands. He says, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Jesus says that we are to set our eyes, our minds, our hearts upon God. To seek him out first and always, and in so doing, the things of this world will be taken care of. Conversely, by focusing on the things of this world first, we are saying that they are more important. Yet we recognize that we are not in control, and so we worry. The true problem is that in serving the cares of this world first, we could lose both them and God. But we notice that we are told to seek two things, God's kingdom and God's righteousness. We are told to seek the kingdom of God, which is to be found in the life to come. One night, a Pharisee by the name of Nicodemus came to visit Jesus, and Jesus told him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Therefore, to seek the kingdom of God is to be saved. It is to hear and to believe the gospel message, to understand our fallenness, to understand our separation from God, to understand our sinfulness, to understand that there is nothing that we can do to meet God's holy and perfect standard, nor is there any way that we can pay the penalty for the sins that we have committed against him. It is to understand that salvation only comes, that forgiveness of sins and a restoration to a right relationship with God only comes through trusting in the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And that by placing our faith in his work upon the cross can we enter into the kingdom of God. Secondly, we are told to seek God's righteousness. We read in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, Paul says, All this is from God who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake we made him... For our sake he made him to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Christ's work on the cross made it possible for us to become the righteousness of God. So in seeking his kingdom, in placing our trust and faith in Christ, we have been reconciled to him. The result of which is that we now have a job to do. In being reconciled to God through Christ, we have been given the ministry of of reconciliation. Paul himself exemplified this at the end of his life as he sat in a Roman prison. We read in Acts, he lived there two whole years at his own expense and welcomed all who came to him, proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. Paul also wrote in Ephesians chapter 2 that, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. To seek God's kingdom and his righteousness is to trust in the saving work of Christ and then to be obedient to God in both living out this new life in Christ and by proclaiming the word to the world the message of reconciliation entrusted to us by God. Just before his ascension, Jesus said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. There is much that could be said about living a godly life, about letting our light shine in an age of darkness about being salt of the earth, about bearing fruit in accordance with living a life of faith in Christ, about how obedience to God is how we demonstrate our love for him, which is only right because it was he that loved us first and sent his son to die on a cross in our place. All of these demonstrate our faith in Christ and give credence to the message that we have been given to proclaim, the gospel of Christ. Many have said that Preach the gospel and use words only if you must. 
but I don't think that is correct. The lives we live, the godly character that is formed in us, the acts of righteous fruit that we bear because of Christ are often indistinguishable from the pretensions of the father of lies to those who don't have eyes to see. Paul says in Romans, For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then will they call on him Call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? Does this mean then that we should simply drop everything and become missionaries in some foreign country? I would say no. In 1 Corinthians chapter 7, Paul says in verse 17, Only let each person lead the life that the Lord has assigned to him and to which God has called him. This is my rule in all the churches. He continues in verse 20, Each one should remain in the condition in which he was called. And in verse 24, So brothers, in whatever condition each was called, let there let him remain with God. Others have expressed this idea in the phrase, bloom where you're planted. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, In the same way, let your light shine before others, so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. And I think that we can all agree that the light of Christ and his gospel is needed just as much in the West as it is in the East, as much in North America as in South America. So, does this teaching about worrying and anxiety mean that if we experience worry, that we have turned our backs on God? Again, I would say no. Showing care and concern for yourself or for those to whom you are responsible, for those around you, is not wrong. In fact, I would, think, I, I would say that neglecting them would be wrong. But we should not let the cares and concerns of this world force us to misplace our trust. To place our trust in money and the powers of this world rather than in God. Paul in Philippians chapter 4 says, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. We do live in uncertain times, and there is much that goes on in the world that could cause us to worry. But if we trust in God, if we live in obedience to God, and when worry creeps in, if we give it over to God, we don't need to live a life of anxiety, but rather we can live a life, live life in the peace of God. I'll close with prayer. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the mercy and the love that you have shown to us through your Son, Jesus Christ. I thank you, Lord, that through him you have made it possible for us to once again be reconciled to you. I pray, Lord, that if there are any here that have not placed their faith in you, that they would do so and that they would experience your love and your mercy for themselves. I pray, Lord, that you would work through your Holy Spirit to strengthen our faith, that we might trust in you in all things at all times that you would grant us guidance and wisdom in dealing with the situations we face on a daily basis, and that rather than letting these concerns overwhelm us, that we would take them to you in prayer so that we might rest in the peace of mind and soul that only you offer. I pray, Lord, that we would always be seeking first your kingdom and your righteousness, and that we, we, and that we would be faithful to the message of reconciliation that you have placed in our care. I pray for these things in your name. Amen.